Let's discuss about row level security in Postgres in this video. Neon is one of the providers that uses Postgres, that offers Postgres as a managed service, and they have introduced a very interesting thing, which I want to talk a little bit in deep about in this video, because I'm sure like you would have your notions of what RLS is and how it works, the pros and cons, but I just wanted to share a bit more that goes beyond this blog post. So let's talk about row level security, what it is and how it works. So imagine you have this table, right, which has these bunch of rows. So the fundamental idea of row level security is that let's say if this is your application and if it's trying to access, it's trying to make a query to the database, right? So it's trying to make some query. It could be anything. It could be an insert operation. It could be a select operation, insert, etc. What you fundamentally want to do with row level security in a, you know, explain me like I'm five sort of thing is two things. The first one is ensure, ensure that this table has a user ID or some sort of ID as a column, right? Three things in fact. Number one is the table has, should have some user ID. The second thing is that there has to be a policy in Postgres that restricts this user ID to authored user ID, right? Number two. And number three is that what you want is include the user ID inside the session information when you're making this query. So what does this mean? So if I tell you, like, let's say if we have something like this, which is, let's say this is a table and this over here is user ID. This could be any other data, right? Let's say this is one, this is two, this is one again, this is two, and this is three, right? So what's happening over here is that let's say that somehow, let's imagine, we'll come to this, how this policy and all of this works. So we, the policy is that the user ID must equal to auth user ID, right? This is the simple policy in Postgres, right? You, this is something you created. Now, once you created this, what you have to do essentially is that before you start any sort of querying with the SQL, you always set auth user ID to the logged in user ID, right? Which you automatically like figure out how you have to do that and beyond that point whatever query you make must always follow this constraint so any row sort of which you are touching or selecting or inserting in that specific session must follow this constraint where the user id is similar it's exactly same to the auth user id which you set in the session right so what it does in a way effectively if i have to tell you is that it automatically sort of inserts in a simple way if you want to understand where user id is equal to whatever auth user id you wrote initially so this inserts that hard constraint inside every single query right that's not exactly this where thing because i mean it can be more complex than that but this is in a nutshell how row level security works now so what neon has done is that they have created their own sort of specific implementation of row level security and they're calling it neon authorize and i'll tell you why they would have to create a separate thing in itself even though like you have something like row level security available as a native thing inside postgres why would you still want to do that well, if you have not seen one of my videos on Postgres, which I posted a couple of weeks back where I showed you like how PG Bouncer and you know how we scale up to 10,000 connections in Postgres using PG Bouncer, you must watch that video. You can even pause this video right now and watch that and come back if you haven't watched that because what I'm gonna tell you next revolves a lot around that concepts also. So I'll tell you the problem with this architecture. So the problem with this architecture is this. When you have a table like this and when you have an application like this, when your application tries to communicate with Postgres, it has to basically establish a connection, right? So it establishes a TCP connection basically with your Postgres database and it starts the communication, right? So this is how it works. However, as we discussed in that specific video, which I just mentioned right now, the Postgres one, this thing is unsuitable for Postgres used by serverless components, which spin up a lot of these connections right if you have lambda or if you have like you know some sort of serverless workload that is creating a lot of these connections you would be surprised how quickly you can take down your postgres because postgres internally does not has any concept of connection pooling or anything right I mean, it sure would have its internal constructs, but it's not meant to receive like thousands of connections, which a typical serverless workload would do, right? So if each of these applications is even maintaining a connection pool of 10 connections for performance, you already have 30 connections, right? And if you are on a smaller Postgres instance that starts with three, 400 connection limit, you would run out of it 
very very quickly so what we do instead of this this is just a quick revision into the last video is that instead of connecting to the database directly what we do is that we make a bouncer instance sit here which is a pg bouncer right this is an ec2 instance this could be a managed or unmanaged instance and what it does is that this pg bouncer instance then maintains a super highway of like 50 or 100 or 150 however many connections you want this maintains the super highway of connections with postgres and it accepts as many connections you can throw on this so it will keep on accepting all of these connections but it will just establish a very few set of connections with the real database so what it will do is it will keep those tcp connections on hold it will sort of act like a proxy but a transparent proxy and a smart proxy so let's say if this connection now suddenly needs to insert a record what it will do is that it will match it will match this one of the connections inside this pool with this connection and it will let it run the query and once it's done it's going to take this connection back right so this still stays connected your application doesn't know it's not connecting to the real postgres but it only receives a connection from pg bouncer when it needs to run a query now one thing which we did not talk about in that video is that pg bouncer as a software runs on three modes these three modes or several levels of brutality when it says in rotating connection supports three things session pooling transaction pooling and statement pooling so i'm going to leave statement pooling out of this you can read the docs about this because our main concern is over here with session pooling and transaction pooling so what's the difference so i showed you that pg bouncer when it tries to when this connection sort of tries to run this query pg bouncer would detect that and what it will do is that say okay here you go take this connection run it and by the time it's running this connection is fully blocked to this specific user this specific application once it's done it takes it back but the connection remains connected right this behavior which i just showed you is the transaction pooling where this specific connection is running one single transaction it could be an insert operation it could be a select operation it could be anything right but this is a one one single operation which is running it could be a real transaction also right the actual transaction thing and that's it the moment that transaction is over pg bouncer will Take that connection will snatch that connection away the real connection so you see it says that when the pg bouncer notices that the transaction is over the server will be put back into the pool which is this server which i just showed you this this is like the real this is the important connection this is the limited resource these many resources they can be like any number of resources right this mode makes a few session based features of postgres you can use it only when application cooperates by not using the features that break right see the table below for incompatible features let's take a look at this feature which is over here set and reset which is supported in session pooling but never in transaction pooling and these set and reset parameters they are the set one especially is required when you want to create this thing right which i mentioned where you want to set the auth user id to the logged in user id right so now you would ask like how do these neon and every other provider work so they have their own ways you can also work around your way but if you are using a pg bouncer in our case for example if we are just using a raw postgres compute not through neon authorize or like these sort of things then if you really want to use postgres you cannot just set something on the session itself it has to be either set local which is just the currently executing transaction or you have to just use session mode right because remember how this works is that it takes away this connection which is the real connection right it doesn't delete it pg bouncer once this query is done what it will do is it will take and put it somewhere else in its own pool right and once let's say this connection comes in now so it will go ahead and attach this to this Thing, right it will run the query on this so what you don't want to do is leak the session state multi among multiple connections right and if you don't want to do that and if you go ahead and use the session pooling then there is basically no use of using pg bouncer as such because you will not be able to reuse the connections very effectively but anyway coming back to the blog what they have done is that they have introduced something known as neon authorize which uses row level security by postgres itself but it uses it in a different way in a different manner so what it does is first of all it recommends you to install an extension known as pg session jwt which is a postgres extension authored by neon itself right so what neon asks you to do first of all right off the bat is install an extension which is something you may or may not want to do right so once you have installed this extension now because neon has access to your postgres also in a way the extension has access to your postgres you can change this 
this logic a bit, right? Because the real, the what I showed you right now is the actual real raw implementation of row level security in Postgres. Once you have an authorization extension, then you can do different things. As you can see, they mentioned with the access logic at the database level, your application becomes much safer. Just like foreign keys enforce referential integrity and cascade deletes can be used to enforce data correctness, RLS can enforce authorization on every database query. So what this says is that this JWT based authentication, this JWT based authentication is not natively supported in Postgres, right? You need an extension for this. Postgres doesn't understand JWT tokens as such, as far as I know. So once you install that, this JWT can be intercepted by Neon proxy, which is most likely their initial receiving server, which receives the query. So it's verified by that and it's added to the request and made available for the RLS rules and the where clauses alike. Furthermore, you'll also have access to a few utility functions such as auth.session and auth.user ID. So you see over here, when you write a query like this, in this query, this users is your table, this user ID is the ID inside that table, which is one in this case, and this auth.user ID is populated based on a JWT which you send with the query, with this extension, PG session JWT. So if we take a look inside this one repository which Neon gave as an example, you can see that they are creating a table to do's with the default value of auth.user ID. That means that your database, if you exclude this value, it's okay, it's completely fine. It'll insert whatever user ID is in the authenticated session, right? So this is also a neat trick. Then you have these couple of policies over here. So you enable row level security first of all, and then you set this thing, right? So which is evaluated on the runtime. So we check using, using and using, right? So this is the actual native implementation of the row level security. So you see over here, this is where a little bit of magic is happening. So inside this db.tsx file, when you are initializing the database object, first of all, you are getting an auth token, right? So remember that this database object is not shared now. Right? So for every new request, you are creating a new database object. So it's not a pool, it's not something like that. And you are making a new, most likely I'm assuming this is an HTTP request because I'm not sure if this would work properly on a WebSocket or a TCP based connection. But you're creating a new instance, you are supplying an auth token function over here and the token itself is this get token function which is returned by auth which is a clerk provider. Again. It, this file itself has so many abstractions that I'm already not liking this because if I look at it from a point of view where we have to use, let's say, Neon and implement row level security, we don't use clerk, right? We don't use, we don't want to do it on HTTP, right? So I don't want to do it on HTTP. I want to maintain a pool of connections with my Node.js Lambda. So it's, it's clearly like something which would not work for us right away, but let's keep going. So once you have this DB connection over here, if you go to actions, most likely I'm assuming there, yeah. So you can see the queries you write from here are now db.select from schema to do's where this user ID is auth.user ID, which is not required, which is also they mentioned, but we send it anyway for performance reasons, right? So this filter is not really required because if you go back and check the SQL files which they have, they already have this view thing using this constraint, right? On the select query. So your select by nature would always restrict it to this, but they are still sending the where clause for performance reason. So this is where the benefit is, right? So let's say if you imagine, let's say if this is a very complex query and you by mistake leave out this where, right? Then it would not be able to get all the records. This is where the real advantage is. Similarly, in this delete, by default, by mistake, let's say if you are running a multi tenant application, which in our case, we are doing, for example, with Fermion, you would see that you are able to create a school, you are able to do create these websites where you are you have many, many features from live classes, coding labs, coding sessions, if you are trying to sell courses, trying to sell your content online, you can use Fermion. So if you're using Fermion, you have a lot of websites like this one, for example, then you have another website, for example, this one, let's say, for some reason, we as developers have written bad code where Shitaj from code eater tries to delete his own course, right? Or a course item and we missed a where clause somewhere. So instead of just deleting his course item, we also end up deleting all the course items on coders GAN. So in order to avoid that, this row level security becomes extremely important because in that specific case, when you are about to delete everything, this row level security rule will kick in and it will say, okay, you are not allowed to do that, right? So that is where the real advantage is. What I don't like about this implementation is that it's very, very deeply tied with the JWT thing, which Neon is using right now, which they will ha anyway have to because of the limitations we just discussed that, you know, the true row level security of Postgres would probably require session mode, right? It cannot just work on normal 
transaction mode of PG Bouncer. Correct me if I'm wrong in the comments, this is something I was not able to find more information on internet, but it intuitively seems like the way because you cannot use or reuse these connections inside of a session variable thing, right? So you can't do something like this, which they have done. And the first thing, the first, first and foremost fact, the moment you do something like this, where you have a DB object created on, you know, sort of every request, you're just basically opting out of pooling right on your application layer so i mean that's okay because neon says that they maintain their own pool so neon also has a pg bouncer so this is like an http thing but your performance would 100 percent be less than what you would actually get on tcp connections on tcp connections within private network on our own postgres that powers for Neon and code dam and all the websites we work on we sometimes like we have even seen like sub five millisecond queries on very heavy tables right with proper indexes very busy tables I would say so we are able to get that and that's like including network latency and all of that I just figured out there is another thing neon authorized this guide over here where it goes a little bit into more into how it works so you see you effectively have to specify an auth token to neon's initialization object and I'm assuming because this works on HTTP if I'm not wrong yeah, you can see one of the limitations right now is that your application must use HTTP to connect to Neon. At this time, TCP and WebSockets connection are not supported. This means you need to use Neon serverless driver over HTTP as your Postgres driver. Yep. So that is a limitation. But what's what's happening over here is that this auth token most likely is going as a header. If you inspect, if you like actually run Wireshark or something or inspect this network request, which it makes when you are running the SQL query, you would see that this auth token most likely is going as a header. And then behind the scenes, once that request is received, by neon servers neon proxy performs jwd validation and then pg session jwd extension extracts the user id available to postgres so it performs the validation and it somehow injects that session information inside postgres with this extension which it asked you to install earlier and then once you have that you have all the information right then you can use row level security policies so you basically bypass this whole thing of like raw architecture of pg bouncer which i explained because they are doing their own magic on the neon proxy and how they communicate from neon proxy to the Postgres instance, underlying Postgres instance. The role level security is implemented by database itself. So Neon is not doing the security aspect by themselves, but they are doing the whole proxying and making it available to the connection by themselves. And okay, they do provide a custom implementation. So that's fine. I thought that they are just partnering up with a few providers somehow <laughs> that their keys and everything is tied with them. But that's, that's good to know that they are able to provide a custom implementation as well. So you have to create a JWT, you have to sign it with a private private key and then I don't know like what you have to do with that key exactly but it's good to know that you can do it at least on your own system because I don't like using auth like I generally don't prefer sourcing out authentication data the auth username passwords to a third party service that's just me like there could be different opinions on this but uh, if you're sure if you're scraping together a quick app or a prototype then sure but other than that always always have a table and learn if you don't know if you are like oh but authentication is so difficult then what are you even doing? I mean, I'm pretty sure that authentication would not be the most difficult part of your business, right? Then at least solve that first or understand like how do you build proper auth systems before you start building your core services. Before Neon authorize, you have to do application level checks, which is boring, which is cumbersome, which is weird but after you have done authorization role level security in database all you have to do is just yolo the query well i would still be highly uncomfortable writing a query like this before app verifying it in the application itself so i would probably not be doing this again like still even if you have role level security but to each their own so they do provide like integrations right out of the box with some of these auth providers but they have like a few limitations connection type one of the biggest one i would probably say and i don't see how they would be able to solve this with the transaction pooling itself because as far as i know neon's pg bouncer also uses transaction pooling right so neon also supports connection pooling and it uses pg bouncer only yep it uses pg bouncer and it uses that in the transaction mode only right so i don't know how they would support it and if they would do it then it would be very interesting to read how that works then they have a jwt expiration delay it may take a few minutes for the jwt signed by the provider to stop working now this is a classic jwt problem because you cannot revoke technically revoke a jwt token algorithm support and postgres 17 is not supported 
exported, right? So overall, it's an interesting feature and it's an interesting thing. And if you like this video, make sure you leave a like and subscribe to the channel. I would leave all the links in the description. So do check them out. Please comment down what do you think about this. And if you think that I was wrong, would love to start a discussion over this. That is all for this video. I will see you in the next one really soon. Thank you.